dear audience, uh, thank you again for coming and welcome back to the autumn of the 22-23 uh, season of Almont Lectures. I hope you had a good summer and that your, all your flights were on time. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our first speaker of the season, Jan Johns. Jan is a retired secondary teacher of chemistry, physics, biology, and mathematics who has been interested in orchids for 50 years. Retirement in 2015 allowed her to pursue her obsession with these exotic and intriguing plants. She currently has over 100 orchids representing 20 different, different genera in her home and garden. She has served with the Orchid Society since 2014 and is currently the president. She also spent five years as second vice president of the Canadian Orchid Congress and is a member of both the American Organ Society and the Orchid Society of Great Britain. The title of Jan's talk tonight, Confessions of an Orchid Lover. Jan. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to tell you tonight a little bit about how I fell in love with orchids and then a little about their care and where they come from and their fascinating habits in the wild. And then I'll finish up with just a little bit about um, the orchid societies that I belong to um, and work for, let's suppose, let's say. Uh, the orchid you see on your screen is a Phalaenopsis, but it's not the kind that you would get in your um, box store if you went to um, Independent or Home Depot. It's called a big leaf orchid, and its name is Phalaenopsis pylos forever. And um, Pilo actually is the hybridizer's dog. So many of these names are um, from things that the hybridizers love. And uh, this one is beautiful. It has a wonderful fragrance. It flowers every year. Uh, I have another one of these called Pilo Slurpee. Um, and uh, I, I'm very, very fond of it. So I first got interested in orchids. Actually, before my 20s, I didn't really know anything about them at all. And, uh, but when I uh, was married and my husband uh, and I were married in August of 1971, I had a very, very good friend in Kingston. And um, unfortunately she has agoraphobia, so she couldn't come to the wedding. And that saddened me. So I thought, well, um, you know, what can I do about this? Well, she told me she had a dream that I had yellow and brown orchids at my wedding. So I just decided to make that dream come true. And sure enough, you can see in these bouquets, I found out later these are cymbidiums. And cymbidiums are great flowers for cut flowers. They last a very long time. Um, they've been known in China since BCs and um, they're still used today in bouquets, although it changed a little bit. Cattleya um, became the flame later on and um, then we're back to uh, Phalaenopsis, which are the common uh, orchid that we have around these days. So that was my start with orchids. So cut to 20 years later, and in 1991, on my 20th, our 20th anniversary, my husband kindly bought me uh, a lovely Phalaenopsis that at th that time was really quite expensive in the store. And um, it, it bloomed beautifully um, while it was there. And then I dutifully read all the instructions, oh, put it in a, in a very um, shady place, i.e. away from direct sunlight. So I dutifully did that. Um, and it sat and stared at me and it stared at me for several years. Uh, meantime, I had beautiful African violets and they all bloomed beautifully in my house and I didn't understand what was going on at all. Then all my African violets died. I paid a little more attention and read that, well, you know, they might need a little more sun than I was giving them. So I moved it. I moved it into this lovely bay window, as you can see here, this was my old house. And in that bay window, um, this orchid just started to thrive and it bloomed for me every year. And that was really my first, oh, I kind of like these. So I went off and bought more. And certainly by the time um, I was finished teaching, because uh, all I could manage was a few of them. And you can see, I didn't really look after them terribly well. You can see all kinds of roots growing out of them, but I did have three uh, gene genera by then. I had a, a lovely 
as well as these valves, I had a Miltoniopsis, which is like a little pansy orchid. And I had some lady slippers as well. And they were they were lovely, um, but clearly I didn't look after them very much. I, I joined the Orchid Society in I think 2004, but then I was only an orchid an acquaintance, not an orchid lover. And uh, I decided that, um, you know, maybe I'd buy a few more. And then we moved and by then I had about 10 of them, but they didn't move well. We moved to another house. And uh, one thing that I found out about these orchids is that they need a high temperature during the day and then a lower temperature at night. And that's what makes them bloom. So in the new house, it was one of those houses that uh, has a in-floor heating and everything is exactly 20 degrees and it stays 20 degrees all the time. And I had to shove a lot of these orchids right up into the window yes. to get them to get that up and down temperature. So two things is you need a little more sun than you think of in Canada, and you need to make sure they have up and down temperatures uh, for them to bloom. And then they're relatively happy. And then of course, there was the issue of repotting. And certainly I lost my uh, Paphia petalum that way because I didn't repot it. And I learned a little bit more about that. Um, but then uh, when I got into the new house, I realized that um, the humidity was very low here. And I, we have a, an HVAC system, which allows me to turn the humidity up. I thought, this is great. So I turned the humidity up to 55% and all my orchids were going, oh yes, we like this. They were looking very green. I was very happy. Um, and then the winter came uh, and it got colder. And all of a sudden, because of the exhaust, the exhaust sealed over with ice and that turned our furnace off. And we didn't notice it. It took about 24 hours before we realized the furnace was off. And then when we finally got it fixed, it took us another almost two days to bring it right back up again. So you can imagine I lost a lot of orchids during that time. So yes, they love humidity, but you got to watch it with uh, exhaust fans for sure. So then I thought, well, I'm going to go and buy some more. And I went to uh, an orchid show. And look at this. I thought, oh, I've got to take a picture of this. And I showed this to my friends and kind of laughed. Now, this isn't me. This is not my display. But this is a wonderful grower called Janet Johns. And she was at the Orchid Society um, at the same time that I was. And little did I know when I saw this that she and I would become good friends and that we would actually chair one of the orchid shows together. Um, and it causes all kinds of problems, but um, it, it really is a pleasure to, uh, to have met her. And that's really when I became an orchid lover. And I have to say that um, on the left, by that time, as I got better and better at growing these things and making mistakes and losing them, as I've already said, um, I started picking fowls up sort of from the wayside, sad fowls, I used to call them. And uh, this is a sad fowl. Um, I went to a restaurant um, somewhere in the Hamilton area and they had gorgeous orchids. And I said, well, how are you getting these orchids to bloom all the time? And they said, oh, well, we just buy them from Cosmic Orchids. We have a deal. They come in and they give them to us. And I said, well, what happens when they stop blooming? She said, oh, we just throw them in the garbage. And I said, you what? I said, do you have any orchids in the garbage? And she said, yes, she pulled it out. And uh, when I joined, rejoined the Orchid Society in about 20, I think, 15 or so, um, this is, um, no, I think, yeah, 2014, perhaps, 2014, 2015, um, I got a best in show from that particular orchid that I had rescued from the dust. So um, success is certainly driven by lots of mistakes, and that's another confession. I've had a lot of orchids that have passed away, but through that, I've learned about how to grow them. And the other thing I learned is that that passion develops while you're learning to correct those mistakes. And that's where I actually fell in love with orchids. So let's talk a little bit more about the orchids. Orchidacea, as they say, is uh, a family of orchids that actually one of the largest in um, the world, um, similar to asters and daisies and grasses. Um, it has about uh, this, at this count, about 27,000 species, but um, probably more than that. 
because in 1985, they listed about um, 19,000 species, and now they're up to 27,000. So I'm quite sure there will be more than that in the future. Um, and these uh, species, there are about 708 genera, and they occur all around the world. Uh, here in Canada, we actually have, and you may not realize this, about 70 plus orchids. Um, and I have a few here. Um, these are my orchids. Um, well, what, some of them are, not all of them. Here we have Cypripedium parviflorum. These are the little uh, yellow lady slippers. We have two varieties here. And you'll often see these up on the burnt lands and they like to be beside the road. You'll often see them, they're, they're quite visible up in the burnt lands in uh, early June um, because they're, um, they're, they're not the kind that want the woodland, they, they want the open spaces. And in fact, unfortunately this stand uh, right now, they don't like a lot of competition and my little bush here um, came up and over them and now I have far fewer of them and I've had to move them over from my garden. Um, now I did not buy these, take these from the wild. I do not transplant orchids. They were purchased from someone who um, produces these on, on their own, they seed them. Um, orchids don't transplant very well from the wild uh, for a number of reasons, um, in particular, they have particular microhabitats that they like. Um, I do have a showy orchid slipper, um, but these, Cypripedium regina, are from the Purden Fen. And uh, that is a wonderful area if you can go out there in mid-June uh, to see showy orchid, uh, uh, showy sl lady slippers. And uh, that is the largest stand actually in North America in the world. Well, not in the world, but in North America for sure. So. Um, it's well worth a trip. Um, now you'll notice that Cypripedium is the genus and the Parviflorum and the Regina make it the species. So when we talk about a species, we have to say Cypripedium Parviflorum, that's the species, but Cypripedium is the genus. So these are both from the same genus. There's another one too that I don't have a picture of. Um, it's Cypripedium acol or the moccasin, often called the moccasin or the um, pink lady slipper. Um, and it is um, rose lady, sl lady slipper, I think. It is far more difficult to transplant. Um, it prefers being in acidic places, in the bogs. Um, it was much used by our indigenous peoples for medicine, um, but it is a much more fragile orchid. And uh, it will not transplant. I've seen people try and dig these out of the ground. And if you try and put them in the garden, they die. Um, so it's just a, a warning that um, they are fragile. Uh, they need particular fungi to grow with. Uh, they need particular um, uh, conditions. So um, please leave them in the wild where you see them. On the right, you'll see another genus. This is an Epipactus helleborine. Uh, and this is actually, believe it or not, an invasive species in Canada. Uh, it tends to grow where other orchids grow and it will, as I say, they don't like competition. Um, it will tend to grow right over the top of them. Um, if you want to keep your orchids in the garden, you really must make sure that they are well mulched um, for the, the winter. Um, the showy orchids, uh, they, they like a boggy environment and they prefer a wetter environment. So those are our Canadian orchids. But in fact, they are all over the world. You can see that we find them in the New World orchids, as we like to call them, the beautiful Cattleya, Cycnoches, the Encyclia, Monsidium, Cycopsis, and Cycopsis is the butterfly orchid that I'll talk about later, the Miltoniopsis, that's the pansy orchid, and the Dracula, which you'll see later as well. From the African region, we have Angricum and Vanilla. If you didn't know that Vanilla was an orchid, now you do. And then of course, from the East, we have the Phalaenopsis, Papiopetalum, we have Cymbidium, Dendrobiums, and the Vandas. Uh, Vandas are particularly beautiful. I've only named the genus uh, that uh, I either have in my house or that I'm going to talk about today. Tropical orchids, though, that's what we're really talking about uh, today. Um, tropical orca orchids are the ones that I've just pointed out are all over this area um, and obviously right around the equator. And they are mostly epiphytes, and that's what makes them a little difficult for some people to grow. 
but not if you know a few tricks. Um, this is a dendrobium. And this grows, as you can see, these are its roots and it just simply wraps its roots around the tree. And that's how it grows. Now, litter falls in here and all kinds of bird poop and uh, insects and things like that. And that's where the nutrients come from. So they don't like a lot of nutrients, just about, just a little. And then you can see down here, these are oncidium. And this huge branch here is just covered with moss and litter. And uh, you can see these wonderful orchids growing out of this um, uh, area here. Now, the key here is to notice that the roots are in the air. And that's what an epiphyte is. And what we want to do when we're growing orchids in, ho in house is we try to reproduce that. So in Florida, it's easy. Uh, you take these Eastern Phalaenopsis, you tie them to a tree, and the conditions are lovely, and there they grow beautifully. These are my sister-in-law's orchids. They're not mine and her pictures. However, what we have to do when we're growing them inside in Canada is we have to look after those roots. So what we do is we try and reproduce that situation with bark. So we put them in bark like this, and you can see that the roots are kind of wrapping around the pot, just like they did in the tree. And what the bark does is it keeps air moving through and, and also keeps the moisture within the pot. So when you water an orchid, you always water it, you let it drip through, and you let it dry out quite a bit. These things prefer to be um, neglected. I think that's why I probably do so well with them is because uh, I tend to neglect them. And so um, they like to dry out and then be watered again. The roots here, as you can see, the actual root inside here is like a little string. And on the outside, this is called velamen. And it's a lot of cells, they actually do photosynthesize and they absorb all the nutrients through these roots. And that's why it's so important um, to make sure that they are in the air. These air roots will dry out after a bit, but um, if you, if you spray them, you will find that they will look green and those are still going and still good. Um, the other thing about orchids is they have slightly different growing habits. So um, many of them are mono, what we call monopodial. This is a Vanda. Now Vandas are interesting because you always grow them bare root, okay? You never put the bark around them. They don't like to be in that environment. They like to be out bare rooted, just falling down. And as long as you run water through them um, a couple of times a week, two or three times a week and spray them <laughs> fairly often, they do very well and they are beautiful. I have just bought a new Vanda, um, which is a blue Vanda, and I'm very excited to see it. Um, they prefer much greater sun. You can put them directly into the um, south window of your house. They might need a little shade in the summer, but probably not. Um, and that is the challenge of uh, some of the orchids. They prefer a little more light than we can provide in our homes. Um, this is a phalaenopsis. It's also monopodial. That is, it grows up. You'll only see it grow up like this. So you can't really take a bulb and divide it. Sometimes you'll get what we call kikis at the end of it. Occasionally you'll get an additional um, uh, plant coming out the side, but it's not like being able to divide a plant. However, there are sympodial, um, what they call sympodial orchids. And that is they have many feet from their roots. This is a pathiopidlum, it's a lady slipper, um, but these are from the east and they are actually quite easy to grow. They like uh, conditions much like Phalaenopsis, sort of not, not necessarily high light, um, but they are terrestrial, so they grow a little differently. Um, and here you can see that, um, if you could see this, you'd see that it has sort of lots of growing points from the roots. So you can actually, um, when these plants get bigger, you can divide them and you can share them with people. And sometimes that's a nice thing to do. Um, but often people like to keep growing them until they're very large and into a species instead. And on the right, of course, we have the Cattleya. This is one of my favorite fragrant orchids. It's quite beautiful. Um, you'll notice that this also has sympodial. It has many feet. 
And if you see here, it's got little what we call pseudobulbs here, little bulbs at the bottom. And plants that have bulbs at the bottom generally need a little more water and they also need a dry period. Um, they have those pseudobulbs because in their environment, there may be a period of time in the year uh, when they need to be a little drier. And it's important to make sure that that occurs because if it doesn't, they won't flower anymore. So um, this is, as I say, something that needs a little more care um, than the fowls. If you have a fowl from uh, your store, very easy to look after. If you start to move into other orchids, you have to spend a little more time. Now, the other thing about orchids is, well, why are they orchids? Well, all of these look very different, uh, but they are all orchids and they have some very similar things. Um, if you look at an orchid or any, any flower that's opening, you look at it as the bud, and you'll see that the buds open up and those are the sepals that are opening up first. And those sepals open up and then the um, petals open up afterwards. So uh, the key with uh, these orchids is that they always have three sepals, one, two, three sepals here. They have three petals. There's one here, one over here, and then they have a labellum or a lip, which is always variegated and very pretty. And here, this, this one is a psychopsis that actually started the Victorian orchid craze. It comes on a very, very long stem and flowers and flowers and flowers. I, from this one, I've had almost 20 flowers already um, in its lifetime and it's still going. Um, this is an Encyclia um, cordigera. It smells, uh, well, it has a fragrance, but my husband thinks it smells like cheap perfume. I think it's kind of beautiful, but there we go. Um, we have three sepals, one, two, three opened up as sepals, and we have three petals, and again, the labellum. This one is a little cyclochis, and you can see one, two, three sepals, and one, two, and this is the other petal that looks a very quite different. And this is a cymbidium. And once again, we have one, two, three sepals and one, two, three petals. And again, the labellum is a little different. And that modified um, petal is quite important because it has on it um, a column, something called a column. And they're hermaphrodites. Um, the hermaphrodites have both the um, stigma and uh, style and anther all together. But they're, and you'd think that they might pollinate themselves if they have pollen, you know, and they can get to the ovary. Well, why don't they self pollinate? They actually don't because the pollinia are in little packets and they're very tight together. So you don't get sort of, it's not like pollen flies everywhere. They're very specific and they're all very specifically, um, what can I say? Um, evolved to pollinate by to be pollinated by one insect in particular so all of these are pollinated very specially now um the other thing i have to tell you in my little um confession is that i mean look at that isn't that the cutest little thing you ever saw this is the pollen on this particular plant and this is the column here and it looks like a little duck and in fact, I find all my orchids are so cute when you look at them very closely. Um, and these are um, um, various Paphiopithelums here. And this of course is the um, Psychopsis that I have. And uh, I know a lot of people find them very exotic and very sexy, but I just find them really, really cute. Uh, and those are my orchids. Now, um, Looking at the time, we're going to move on a little bit more about orchids in general, and especially about pollination. Um, believe it or not, um, the orchid, orchidaceae family, um, they, are, they are monocots. Um, if you remember from grade nine, they have parallel uh, veins in their leaves, and this is why their sepals and petals are in threes. And um, the... Uh, Monocots were one of the first of the flowering plants. 
So they date back probably to the Cretaceous period, and we can actually think about dinosaurs really walking on them. Um, so um, they are old enough to have developed some really very special um, pollinators, relationships with their pollinators. And each individual orchid tends to be pollinated by one specific insect. Now, in the 18, mid 1800s, um, there were some people who had an awful lot of money. And unfortunately, they were able to pay explorers a lot of money to go to various places in the world as the world opened up with um, the East India companies, etc. And it was very important for people to look at um, botanical species um, because it might bring them money. If you think about tobacco, if you think about food, um, it might provide clothing, it might provide um, stimulants of some kind. So uh, that kind of exploration was important. Um, but then all of a sudden people found the orchids and they literally went into the forests and, and poached them big time. And many of them didn't make it all across uh, the, the ocean, but some did. Um, and that started the orchid craze because it was very difficult for people to grow them at that time. So only people who had an awful lot of money uh, were able to pay the orchid hunters to go over and find them and then um, spend the time to develop the situation so that they could be grown. And during that time, um, Charles Darwin, of course, was very busy. And um, in, I think it was 18, I'm going to check my notes here. Um, pardon me. I just want to get this right. I think it was in, yes, Origin of Species was in 1859. So, um, and he was quite interested in orchids at the time himself. But he also used the orchid craze because in the origin of species, there were a lot of people who did not believe in natural selection and there were a lot of arguments about it too. Um, he was very interested in orchids and people brought him orchids. Uh, and he also studied orchids in a place called the Orchid Bank, uh, which was right next to where he lived. And he looked at the pollination strategies in particular Somebody bought him one of these Angricum sesquipedales that come from um, Africa, Madagascar in particular. And he looked at them and he realized and did actual experiments. If you see here, this is a long, what we call spur. And the nectar for the um, pollinator is right in the bottom of the spur right here. And this is a picture that, this is not my Angricum, but it's uh, my picture that I took from um, some that um, actually are, somebody bought the society. And you can see that each of them have sort of a stem, but also this spur, this green spur that comes out the back. Now, Charles Darwin looked at it very carefully and he said, you know, if you have this orchid, the thing that pollinates, the insect that pollinates, must have a tongue or a proboscis that can go down to the bottom of this spur so that it flattens itself against the flower and gets to uh, transfer the pollen. And so he said that, you know, it must happen, that this must happen. And um, he uh, suggested that that proboscis had to be 35 centimeters long. Uh, in order to uh, pollinate this particular flower. And of course, everybody laughed at him. However, he continued to look at orchids, including sort of catacetum and other things. And he actually produced a book um, on the pollination of orchids right around the orchid craze time, uh, partly to support his theories on natural selection because he could do these experiments with them. Uh, and in fact, un and unfortunately, um, the moth that uh, pollinates the um, Angricum sesquipedale uh, wasn't discovered until much later, about 20 years later after he died. Um, so he never got to say, I told you so, but it was predicted. Um, and it is a moth called, I think, uh, Xantheropa. Um, uh, here's where I have to unfortunately look at my notes again, and I apologize for that. 
um, and Xanthopan morgani predicta. And it was discovered in Madagascar and um, it was discovered in 1903. And unfortunately, um, Charles Darwin died in uh, uh, 1882. So um, what I wanted to show you also is that these wonderful orchids have lots of ways of interacting with their pollinators. Um, in particular, some of them, as we've just seen, offer some um, nectar, obviously. Some of them just offer the scent of the nectar and they don't actually offer the, the nectar itself. Um, but this uh, wild bee orchid, and this bee orchid is uh, endemic sort of in the Mediterranean region, including North Africa and right over to sort of the Asia in that era. Now you'll notice actually that um, if you look at this one, um, this has tubers. Uh, these uh, European orchids and European continent often had tubers. And in fact, this is where the name Orchidacea comes from because orchis was the name for testicles. And in fact, these were used um, for medicines uh, for various ailments in, in uh, reproduction, etc. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, a very short, um, about three minutes long video of a particular bee orchid and uh, its relationship uh, with its plant. Somewhere in the crowd of insects busy among these dwarf shrubs, there's the one exact customer for which the orchid is so passionately advertising. But what is it that will lure the long-horned bee away from the pleasures of other flowers? These virgin flowers not only look like female bees, but smell like them. They exude a seductive perfume, identical to that secreted by female bees. Males are irresistibly drawn into an embrace. What follows is a sequence of remarkable events. He is further deceived by the shape and furry texture of her bee-like lip. He attempts to mate, but will never achieve his own satisfaction. Frustrated, he'll move from flower to flower. But that's a part of the orchid's ploy. Were he to be satisfied, he'd quickly lose interest and fly off before collecting pollinia. The orchid drives the bees into so great a passion that rival males will struggle to possess a single flower. Suddenly, these yellow pollinia attach to one of them. A success for the orchid, but no satisfaction for the bee who persists with this hopeless mating. finally has to rest a while, and the two pollinia complete a forward bending movement that'll leave them well aimed and ready for the bee's next onslaught on a flower. The bee will visit other flowers following its usual routine, but eventually he'll be lured into the same deception by another bee orchid, where the pollinia will make precise contact with the stigma ahead and leave their pollen grains. Successfully fertilized, the deceiving flower fades. And in the following days, the capsule swells with the developing seeds and rises to stand upright, the ideal position for scattering the seeds to the wind. It sometimes happens that the insects transfer pollen between two different kinds of orchid. The resultant seeds grow into plants that are a colorful mixture of the two parents. Such hybrids are usually sterile. They have a fleeting beauty without a future.
somewhere. So um, I hope you enjoyed watching that. It, it always fascinates me, um, the uniqueness of all of these relationships between um, the plants and their pollinators. Um, another thing that, it, and, and the other point about that is that, of course, if they're uniquely um, attached to one particular pollinator, it makes them very fragile because if anything happens to that pollinator, um, then they won't be able to reproduce in the wild. Um, they may be able to grow from one plant, but they can't produce new seeds and therefore increase their um, lot in, in, in life. Um, in addition to that kind of fragility, um, when pollinated, uh, each flower has the ovary and that develops into a seed pod. Now here, these are vanilla orchids. Um, you, not, you did, may not have known that, but once the vanilla flower has um, been fertilized and then it has these long seed pods. And these are what we buy um, when they've been roasted and variously looked after. This is sort of the seed pod that you find in the store. And if you um, put your um, knife down it, you'll find these little sort of little bits of seeds inside. In fact, those are almost clumps of seeds. The seeds themselves, there are about a million in each pod. Um, they're like dust and they um, are easily dispersed by the wind so they can um, go everywhere. Uh, but there's an issue with them. And that is they don't have any what we call endosperm. If you think about an egg or even the beans that you eat, um, they all have some kind of a something that will help that very first little cell to grow into a flower. It gets them into the sort of protocorm stage. But this doesn't happen with orchids. What they do is they use the mycorrhizae in, this, in the soil, the fungus around it, um, and they, it's a very sort of um, parasitic relationship or symbiotic parasitic relationship. Um, and they use that to, uh, as nutrients for them to grow. So some of the orchids need very specific fungi. And those ones, again, if you move them away from where they are and you don't move the fungi with them, um, then they won't grow into the protocorms and they won't grow up. And of course, many of these seeds never grow to maturity. I mean, if you've got a million seeds, it's uh, you know, one in, one in probably 100,000 that might actually seed itself. So uh, orchids we've just seen are uniquely uh, adapted to their microhabitat. They don't transplant very well at all. Um, they are quite difficult to reproduce in cultivation. Um, it's taken a long time to go from getting them out of the wild and actually reproducing them and making hybrids of them. And of course, we are certainly far along that way. As you know, uh, you can buy these wonderful uh, uh, paths, uh, Phalaenopsis in the um, stores for 20 bucks. Um, so we're, we're, we're certainly moving in a, in a good direction in that sense. Um, but in the wild, um, they're, they're, some of them are still very difficult to cultivate. Uh, one of them are the Dracula. These are the monkey orchids. Um, these come from sort of Ecuador, Colombia, that kind of area. Um, they're very difficult to grow. Um, I have to confess, here's a confession, I actually have one now. Um, I've worked with the Mastivilia, which are a little less endangered, um, and uh, I've killed one or two, but now I think I have it. Um, so I have a little aquarium in which I am growing my, um, my Dracula. Um, one of the things about the wild is uh, these Dracula, these monkey orchids are very much in favor. And one of the problems is poaching. Um, two things, actually. I suppose um, habitat loss, of course, and poaching are the main um, strains on these particular orchids. So when we try to preserve our species, uh, one of the things we think about is, well, we can have a reserve, as we do with the Madagascar Land Trust. That's the whole point, is to preserve the area in which they grow. And certainly there are Dracula reserves and um, we've uh, contributed to those, um, but it sometimes isn't quite enough. Um, I can, I'm sure you can imagine that if you are in this area and that you don't have a lot of money and you're dealing with poverty, 
uh, and you know that um, people will purchase these orchids if you can get them from the wild, um, these orchids will continue to be poached. And then you think, okay, well then the other way of um, making sure that the biodiversity exists is to take those orchids and to grow them yourself. And that way you can make sure that at least in the world that that species still survives. Unfortunately, what happens with hybridizers is they do line breeding. And that is they want to make these orchids easy for everyone to sort of grow. So even though they're working with a species, um, line breeding produces a species that is much more um, happy to grow in their own environment rather than to grow in the wild. So some of them actually, you know, after a while may not be suited back into the habitat they were originally. So that is, these are the difficulties um, with orchids in the world. Uh, and I'm always very aware when I, I purchase orchids um, exactly who it's, I'm getting it from and to make sure that I have orchids that have been sustain sustainably uh, produced um, either in my garden or in my house. And that's a very important feature. So um, that's a little bit about orchids. So let's go on just to sort of finish up quickly is about orchid societies. Um, so the American Orchid Society and I of the American Orchid Society, the Canadian Orchid Congress and the Ottawa Orchid Society, they all have, you know, three things that they really worry about. One is education. Um, this is how you learn about orchids. Another is conservation for the very reasons I've talked about them and conservation is a part of all of these uh, societies. Um, now, American Orchid Society also pays for research and does research in orchids, um, but they also offer awards as do the Canadian Orchid Congress and even we in the Ottawa Orchid Society make sure we have our awards too, because that seems to encourage people um, to grow orchids and to grow them well and to be responsible in growing. Um, these uh, societies offer you lots of magazines and what this is a wonderful book called Orchids in Their Culture and it's sort of a little handbook to make sure that uh, you can grow each and every um, species well. Um, and it prevents you from going online and buying uh, this, which says for $14.71, you can have 50 of these seeds. Uh, by then, even from this talk, you'll know that no, you're not going to be able to reproduce these. Most orchids in the wild take from between two and 10 years to actually mature to blooming size. And you won't ever find a blue phalaenopsis like this. This is one that's been dyed. So if you try to rebloom it, it'll be white. Uh, so watch out for those online offerings of seeds for any kind of orchid at all. Um, you need to go to a responsible vendor and that's something that orchid societies will make sure that you go to. Um, they also, the American Orchid Society in particular, um, is the key uh, set for judging. And they have the judging standards really almost right across the Americas, both in South America and uh, North America. Um, if you want to become a judge, um, you have to, we have judging centers both in Montreal near us and we have a judging center in Toronto. And if you want to spend from um, six to seven years of your life, uh, you can become a fully accredited judge. It's not something I want to do, but um, I have to say that uh, it's really interesting talking to judges. It's very rigorous. Uh, they learn an awful lot about orchids and conservation and all of those things. Um, and um, it's, it's something that I know our, our younger members do, but I figure I'm probably not going to be able to see an orchid by the time I, I might make it to, to being a judge. Um, they also are the accredited judges. We, we have about, in our society, our Ottawa Orchid Society, I think we have about five or six accredited judges, and they are the ones who judge our uh, monthly meeting shows. We always, at our monthly meetings, we have orchids, um, people bring their orchids, and we have obviously a competition and ribbons are given. Um, and we have our um, American orchid judges who do that for us. Um, but we also have, um, they also sponsor shows. When I say sponsor, they sort of give us the guidelines for how shows should uh, be done. All the orchid societies have a show. 
Um, in addition to which, um, they do award photography, and many of us have learned a lot about photography from the American Orchid Society. We have um, a, 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 one of these um, photographers in our society as well, uh, and they um, pass on a lot of good information about how to take good pictures. However, the key thing here is orchid shows. One of the wonderful things about belonging to an orchid society is that uh, we get to share our love about orchids and talk about them. We also get to work together. Uh, this is uh, when orchid shows were still live back in 2019. Um, this was the very last show of 2020 in February. Um, my friend um, Helen Nitschke and I um, collected orchids from our members and then we motored them on down to um, uh, uh, Hamilton and uh, this is the Orchid Society of the Royal Botanic Gardens and we set up this display and uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to do. It's a lot of fun um, and, and we get to see beautiful orchids and you can see we win ribbons too and that's a very nice thing to do. Um, we, at our monthly meetings, we have show tables, but we don't do displays like this. And obviously you need, probably you might never have been to a show. So um, I wanted to show you our promotional video um, that is from um, 2019, because we did not, we were not able to have a show in 2020, it was canceled. So this is from 2019. And uh, I will tell you a little bit more about our hopefully orchid show that will come up this year. But I also want to say that this is narrated by Dave Cooper, um, who just passed away recently. He's been our show chair uh, for, I think, over 25 years. And uh, it's we, we miss him a lot. And um, so I just wanted to, uh, he was from Almont. And um, we're very sad not to have him anymore. But it's nice to hear his voice in this video. This short video will introduce you to the Ottawa Orchid Society show and sale coming up this April at the RA Centre on Riverside Drive. If you've never been to an orchid show before, you're in for a pleasant surprise. The Ottawa Orchid Show is one of the best in the area. My name is David Cooper. I'm the chairman for this year's show and I personally guarantee you'll be impressed. The first part of the show has stunning displays of orchids of all types, colors, shapes and sizes displayed in impressive settings. The large displays are immediately eye-catching, but some of the smaller displays are equally impressive with lots of attention to detail to make them look as natural as possible. Feast your eyes on the overall displays and look closely to see the details in the individual flowers. Take as many photos as you like, the subject matter is endless. As well as plant exhibits, we have educational displays that focus on various aspects of orchid culture with a wealth of useful and interesting information. We have a fragrance display where scented orchids are showcased and you have a chance to check out their scents for yourself. We also have a society booth where we can give you help and advice with all your orchid related questions. And we have a raffle where you could win yourself an orchid plant. After the exhibits, don't miss the sales area where we have a wide range of orchids in bloom as well as seedlings and supplies for those who prefer growing your own. This area is very popular and can get pretty busy at times, but we have plenty of space so you can take your time and browse at leisure. We are wheelchair friendly and we also have plenty of seating if your energy starts to flag. Last but not least is our art gallery where we have all kinds of artwork including paintings, handicrafts and photos all relating to the orchid theme of the show. Our admission prices are very reasonable and we offer discount coupons on our website. From time to time there may be lineups to get in, especially at noon on Saturday when we open, but it's well worth the wait. We hope to see you at the RA Centre this year. So that was Dave Cooper, as I've said. Now this year's Orchid Ophelia, we're hoping to come back live this year. Um, it will be hand, ha, held sometime at the end of April, but we have to look for a new venue, sadly. Um, things change during the pandemic, and uh, uh, the RA Center is no longer able to host us, sadly. They have changed their um, uh, rink that we used to use, their curling rink, into a pickleball. Um, uh, and so it's used year-round, so we can't rent it. Um, so we are looking for a new venue, but please stay tuned uh, to our website. 
And hopefully at the end of April, um, we will be able, we'll be able to announce pretty soon um, exactly what those dates will be. Um, and just to sort of finish up, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how cool it is to belong to societies where I know people um, from all across really the world, um, from Ontario, from uh, Canada, from um, England, from other places, people I can actually call up and talk to um, and about a particular orchid that I might want to talk about. Um, but this was one of the things that I is very personal to me. Um, many times, a couple of years ago, when, well, no, not, I would say before I joined the Orchid Society, um, I found out that my great grandfather had actually registered an orchid in 1899. Um, he was Francis Burrell. And uh, I didn't know anything about it at the time because it said Lelio Catlea, and I could never find it. So I didn't really worry about it. Um, but when I joined the Orchid Society, I certainly did find out about it. And I found out that, yes, there actually is uh, an orchid named after my great grandfather, Catlea Varelli. And he was the very first to register it at the Royal Horticultural Society. So I thought that was kind of cool. And then um, talking about those connections across the, across the pond, um, I uh, was contacted by um, Simon Harris, who ends up being my second cousin, twice removed or whatever. Anyway, we have a, 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 a common ancestor, uh, Vice Admiral George Edward Watts, and um, his brother uh, and, and wife uh, had a, were involved in an orchid society in Great Britain. And he was looking for people on from this line of the vice admiral to see if we had any of the memorabilia um, from his life. And of course we do. Um, and in order to contact me, uh, one of the things they were doing was they knew I was sort of in the Ottawa area and they looked at the website and found out that Janet Johns was listed there. So they called up Janet Johns, but of course it was the other Janet Johns, it wasn't me. Um, but when she talked to me about the strange person who called from England and mentioned something, I said, hey, I know that. That's my grandfather. And so uh, luckily, she still had the number. We called him back. And uh, I was connected with um, a very long lost sort of line of cousins from England. So I thought that was pretty cool. And that was all through orchids. And finally, references. Um, there are a lot of really good books, and I can uh, let you um, know more if you want them. Uh, this uh, Orcus Bank from Orchid, A Cultural History, was the piece that I used for um, uh, Charles Darwin. And then other information on Orchid, Orchidacea was obviously from Kew Gardens. And these are the websites um, in which you can find all kinds of information, cultural information, pictures, uh, anything you need to know about orchids are pretty well uh, encapsulated on that site. And on that note, um, I will end my talk and I'd like to thank you all very much for being here. And I hope you learned a little bit about orchids. And I'll stop oh. sharing now. Here we go. Well, thanks so much, Jan. And uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions from the audience. If you want to turn on your uh, microphone before you ask your question, that would be great. And I, I'll be looking for you on my screen. Any questions or comments? Um, I have a question, uh, uh, Judy, Judy McGrath. Um, uh, I've um, uh, an orchid that uh, that I was growing grew uh, two stems of flowers, and uh, along that those both stems new plants grew, and so about eight eight inches up the stem I have these these two um, two new plants, yes. and um, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm I'm wondering whether I should leave it like that. Or if 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 there's um, uh, 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 if I should detach them and and try uh, grow, uh, potting them or 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 what? 
Well, basically, it sounds like you have a phalaenopsis that has kikied on you. They have little baby plants, little kikis, and we call them kikis, baby plants. Once the um, uh, roots on them are sort of long enough, you know, about that long or so, and it looks like it's got a good root mass, by all means, take them, separate them, and then put them into potting material carefully and then treat them like other orchids and you've got baby orchids. It often happens when they're um, warmer in a warmer environment, they'll kiki on you rather than flower. Um, oh. And it probably, if, if you don't remove them, it might not flower again. So, it, you, but you need to wait until you've got enough root mass that it'll, it'll survive. Okay, great. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. No problem. My pleasure. Yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed your talk. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions or comments? I'd just like to say what a wonderfully entertaining and informative uh, talk. It was oh. absolutely delightful. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have to say one of the reasons I joined an orchid society is because usually when I talk about orchids, people's eyes kind of glaze over. And the lovely thing is when you go to an orchid society is everybody's talking about orchids. You can talk for hours and it's all good. <laughs> so thank you for listening. It's quite wonderful, thank you. Other questions or comments? I have one. Yes, Rina. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I knew nothing about orchids. All I ever knew was walking past them in the gardening section of Loblaws. And they didn't really look real to me. They were, I don't know, but the, when you, showed the pictures of them looking like little monkeys or clowns or whatever. It, it's really neat. And then the pollination thing is really neat. So they became, they've become more real to me. So, but my question is, are there such things as orchid babysitters? Because it sounds like you need to spend every waking hour looking <laughs> after them. And how do you go away on a holiday? and leave your plants. So right. that's an interesting question and a very good one. Thank you. Um, I water my plants about once a week. A couple of them I have to kind of worry about and, and water a little more often, but I only water them once a week and I spray them every day. Um, but, um, and I do watch out for insects because I have just got thrips and insects and pests are a pain. Um, so you do have to watch for that. But that's the other thing about orchid societies is that we tend to, if we're away, we find other people in the society who will come and do sort of general maintenance. Um, I know one gentleman, though, who has figured out, he's built this contraption that waters them kind of automatically. So he can go away for like a month at a time and it's all set up because I think a lot of orchid people really like to do all this technology stuff uh, to, to water them and he, he can leave them for a month and it's never a problem. So, um, but yes, it takes a little bit of time, I have to say. And, and I think that's why I never had a hundred till I was retired, uh, much easier to look after 10. And then I didn't really look after them well at that point. So um, you're, you're right. And in all honesty, they are my pets and um, I don't go away a lot. <laughs> Um, and if I do, I find friends. So, One good point. Um, how do you transport them to a show? How do I transport them? Yeah. Very, very carefully. <laughs> you have to pack them. You pack them around and you stake them. Um, and it's interesting. Some of these orchids will grow around five to six feet tall. And um, the only way you can transport them is if you have uh, one of those tall vans. Um, and we do have people bringing those orchids to the shows for displays. Um, but I know the height of my car when I have to take them. And so I tell people, this is your height limit. And that's the biggest problem. And, and packing them too um, with phalaenopsis, with anything that has a tall spike on it, you always have to put it so that the spike is kind of parallel to your movement because if you put it sideways and you're moving like this the spike can break so and and uh, some of the orchids too um, will bruise if you touch the flower uh, a few of them are, are quite difficult that way so yeah not not always easy usually you have this tiny little orchid in this huge great box that's all sealed off 
And, and when you drive them down in February, um, you cannot stop for lunch. Uh, so basically, <laughs> you if you need to stop anywhere along the way, one person stays in the car to keep the engine running and the other person runs into the washroom and then you do a little switch. So, yeah. <laughs> If anyone wants to ask a question or make a comment using the chat feature of Zoom, uh, please do. I'm trying to scan that too. Anyone else have a comment or a question? I see Glenda has asked, where can we purchase the growing medium, the bark or the soil necessary for proper growth? Um, there, you can actually, hmm, there is, Miracle Grow has some orchid um, mix that you can use in a pinch, but um, it's not great. Um, if you go into um, the, uh, actually, I think we do have some on our own uh, Ottawa Orchid Society um, list. There's, there's a, there are people down in Stratford um, and they will ship to you who have really good um, bark uh, medium. Um, you, if it's just one orchid, call me, I'll help you out because I buy it in great big bulk boxes. Um, but the other thing is you go to the show or you come to um, a meeting, perhaps, um, if you're interested in joining. It's only $25 uh, for the year. Uh, we have monthly meetings right through from September to June, um, to May, I should say. And um, we sell, usually there's someone there who's selling um, medium in some way, whether it's sphagnum moss or bark or anything else. And I think you can also buy coconut. Um, we have a vendor in Ottawa who sells coconut bark that is quite good for fowls. Uh, that works out quite well. So um, do you prune after flowering and how long will it take to rebloom? Interesting. Um, for Phalaenopsis in particular, yes, once it finished blooming, you cut it off. You can, if you cut it off just below, sort of a, just above a node, it might branch out again and give you more flowers. But if it does that, then it won't bloom as well the next time around. It takes a lot of energy. So I tend to cut mine right off when they finish blooming, and then they will rebloom, hopefully, if you have it in the right area, right sun, et cetera, and the up and down temperature. Um, the only thing is, it depends on the fowl itself. Usually they will rebloom each year. But for instance, I have one fowl that just, as soon as it's finished one spike, it sends up another. It just constantly blooms. And that really depends on, on the fowl itself. So now with the psychopsis, if I prune that stalk, I would lose all my flowers because it blooms from that exact same stalk. As I say, I've had over 20 flowers and it's been blooming for four years now and it just keeps throwing up those flowers. Uh, Psychopsis are great little plants to get. Uh, if you can buy it blooming already, you've got nothing to do. You just keep it watering and just let it keep flowering. They're, they're wonderful. So hope that's helpful. And others for do a last call for a question or a comment? Thanks. I remember mm -hmm. when I first heard of orchids, it was Rex Stout's Detective Nero Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He wrote 35 books. And apparently Nero Wolf, the fictional detective, would spend four hours a day. He'd go upstairs in his flat to a controlled environment and tend to his orchids. And the rest yeah. of the time he spent in his armchair or eating gourmet food. And then whatever was left over, he solved crimes. And they said his first orchid came from a wife of a man he got off on a, he was being charged for something and Nero Wolf got him off on the charge. So his wife, gifted him an orchid. So he wrote 35 books and in every book, I think he was tending his orchids. So anyway, that was a uh, reference. Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I think he had a special equipment and he had probably more than a thousand orchids, I think. Uh, <laughs> to have four hours to look after them a day, that's, that's a little bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> There's um, therapy for that. Yeah. Um, Rona has just asked, under what condition would you transplant an orchid? Um, I'm, I'm thinking you mean repotting, 
rather than transplanting? Um, and if it's repotting, when do you do that? Um, interestingly, if you can look at the bark itself, like some of them come in moss, some of them in, in, in bark. Um, if you have them in moss, unless you're a good grower, it, it's really not a good idea. You should probably move them into bark if you can. Um, and you can't do it immediately. Orchids don't like to be um, get into a, a, a new environment without kind of stepping through it. You can't just suddenly put it in a window in a bright light, for instance. You need to kind of move it gently towards. Um, so if you put it in half sphagnum and half um, bark, uh, that will keep it going. Um, but basically, when the medium breaks down, if you remember, you want it like bark, you want it like a tree, um, that bark will break down eventually. And then it'll put out little pieces and tiny little pieces and kind of break down. And then all of a sudden, it's packed. It's earth. It's no longer bark. And so the air won't get through. So conditions in which you transplant are when, you know, obviously it's growing out of its pot and not doing very well, or if that bark has broken down. Um, and once that happens, you really do have to repot it or you will lose the orchid. It will become quite acidic and it'll die. So I hope that's helpful. All right, my goodness. What a lot of information and in interesting way. <laughs> All right, well, uh, just thank to, you uh, very much. See you final. Um, acknowledgements and thank yous and so forth. If you can stay for just two more minutes. Um, first of all, I want to once again thank Mel Turner for the technical assistance he provided. He's in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, and Glenda Joan for the publicity that uh, she's given us for these and so many other lectures. So thank you once again for that. Mostly I want to thank Jan for a wonderful presentation. Well done, and uh, and please do another sometime. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll get that one about you know from from taking them out of the wild into um, the fowls in the in your box store. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, next month, if you haven't read already, there the uh, speaker who was supposed to speak last year but couldn't because of political conflicts and. Eastern Africa. Uh, her name is Hatla Thorstein's daughter, and she's going to talk about not wars in Africa, but uses of high technology there. It should be very different and quite interesting. I hope you come. And the one after that, as you may know, is um, uh, Richard Van Loon once more talking about early explorers of Canada. He's going to concentrate on David Thompson. So I hope to see you at uh, at least one more of those. Uh, and in the new year, we'll have a new lineup that we'll be trying to negotiate between now and then. Okay, so let's go have a glass of wine and look at orchid pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye for now. <laughs>